My name is Janice Kaminer Resnick, and I'm very uh, pleased and proud to be able to welcome you all to this, our first virtual seminar, uh, a continuation of our community conversation series that we have been holding over the last two and a half years. First of all, I want to, I want to hope that everybody on the call is safe and healthy, and anybody who is ill, we wish you a full recovery, and anybody who is mourning the loss of a friend or family member, we grieve with you during these really awful, terrible, terrible times. So thank you though for, for taking time out of your schedule, whatever it is you're doing to, um, to be with us today. I also want to especially thank any doctors and nurses and first responders who are on the call for the heroic work that you're doing, exposing yourself to such danger on a daily basis. So thank you for that. This virtual series uh, is an extension of our community conversations program uh, which held before the pandemic 13 different um, panel discussion lectures over the course of the last two and a half years with some amazing thinkers and journalists, two of whom um, you're going to hear from tonight. And over the course of this, of this five-part series, you're going to hear from most of the people that we, we uh, had on the program over the last two years. So you'll be able to get their new perspective on where we've come. These programs have been jointly developed and are sponsored by Jews United for Democracy and Justice and Community Advocates, Inc. in a partnership. And um, we just introduced this five-part virtual series. It's six parts, actually. We have a sixth lecture that we're um, going to be telling you about. With It's very exciting. Uh, Congressman Adam Schiff would really like to address our group and has asked for an hour on May 13th. So you'll get... Um, an email about that. I'd like to acknowledge our donors who made all of these uh, programs possible, um, both the ones before the pandemic and now these, Abner and Roz Goldstein, the Breslauers, the Sora Foundation, Louie and Lee Liner, Mark and Ellie Liner, Jerry and Julia Gorin, and Marvin and, and Barbara Salvin. So thank you very much for that. The core mission of both of our organizations is to inspire people to keep informed, and to protect our democracy. And in the case of Jew Jews United for Democracy and Justice, it's also to, to see the correlation between core Jewish values and core American democratic values. And on the call today, you're not seeing them, but it are the rest of our executive committee, Mel Levine, Xavier Oslovsky, uh, Carolyn Kelly, David Lehrer, who you do see, and um, Rabbi Ken Chazen. With that, uh, by the way, registering for future programs, each after each program, like to, after tonight, you will receive the flyer for the next program, and you'll be able to uh, go to Eventbrite and register for that with a live link. Um, and I already told you about asking questions. One of the most important people in this process has been David Lehrer, who has been extremely instrumental in developing this lecture series. And now I would like um, to introduce David. Take it away, David. Thank you, Janice. It's a pleasure to work with you. On behalf of Community Advocates, of which I'm president, I'm pleased to join you and welcome you to the first of our America at a Crossroads series of virtual town halls. I think our lectures will be performative, lively, and engaging. And it's been, and tonight and the next, subsequent ones are, are an impressive lineup of thoughtful speakers and moderators. By the way, everyone who signed up for this program will receive an email from the Forward newspaper offering the opportunity to sign up for a free one month subscription to the paper and its daily newsletter. You can go to forward.com backslash conversations to register if you don't receive the email. The Forward is one of our co-sponsors and they are joined by an impressive list of Los Angeles institutions, including Temple Israel of Hollywood, Leo Beck Temple, Carr, Stephen Weiss Temple, and the Jewish Center for Justice. Tonight's moderator is a fixture on the Los Angeles news scene, the incomparable Warren Olney. He's the host and executive producer of To The Point and To The Point's Climate Change Update. They are podcasts based on his 50 years of experience as a journalist in print, commercial TV, and public broadcasting. He formerly hosted the local focus Which Way LA and a nationally syndicated To The Point on Santa Monica's KCRW 89.9. Only and his programs have been honored with nearly 40 national, regional, and local awards for broadcast excellence. Warren will introduce our distinguished panelists. Warren? David, thank you so much. And uh, let me just thank Janice as well for what she said uh, to all of those who are listening today and who are presumably are going to be uh, participating as well uh, for whatever it is that you're going through under this uh, extraordinary situation that we find ourselves. 
uh, in. And uh, I just want to uh, identify myself uh, with what Jana said uh, about our, all of our concerns, I think, uh, for all of you, uh, whatever it is that you may be going through. The topic we have tonight is wonderfully uh, broad. Uh, three years of the Trump administration, what has gone on and where are we headed? That allows us to talk about almost anything we want to. Uh, and I'm happy to hear that because we have two people who have been on all of, not all of my programs, but on many of my programs on both radio and on pad podcasting. I'm delighted to have them uh, on the uh, program and let me introduce them. Jennifer Rubin uh, is the opinion writer for the Washington Post. It turns out three pieces a day. Uh, she is the poli she covers politics and policy, both domestic and foreign. She uh, provides insights into the conservative movement. Uh, she talks about the threats to Western democracy. Uh, before she was in journalism, she practiced law for 20 years. Norm Eisen is a senior fellow at Brookings. He was President Obama's ambassador to the Czech Republic. I appreciate that. My grandfather came from Czechoslovakia. Uh, he was also President Obama's ethics counsel, and he was special counsel to the House Judiciary Committee during the impeachment hearings and the trial. And he is founder of the Committee for Responsibility and Ethics in Washington. Having introduced these extraordinary people who probably need no introduction to this audience, let me let them speak for a moment uh, or a few moments. Jennifer Rubin, give me five minutes. Let's go. All right. Well, thank you all for having me. Uh, and uh, my hopes that everyone is uh, well and uh, safe and uh, has not completely broken down from cabin fever yet. You know, uh, Norm and I, who have known each other now for a number of years, like to joke that the Trump administration is not a series of stories, but it is the same story over and over and over again. And what is that story? It's the story of a president who, unlike every predecessor of either party in our modern era and the parties that preceded that, really does not buy in to the set of norms, laws, principles, values on which the country was founded. Um, whether we've had good presidents, bad presidents, indifferent presidents, there has been a common understanding of the presidency as a emblem and as a symbol of um, the United States, as well as the head of government. Um, in our system, obviously, um, we have a combined head of state and head of government. But until this president, we had presidents who by and large believed in such concepts as truth, as the rule of law, as separation of powers, um, and who took seriously the role of America in the world. Now we have a president who doesn't buy into any of that. And the story of the last three years has been the degree to which, with varying levels of success, we have been able to sustain and defend our democracy uh, despite this president. And we've done that through lots of different ways. Um, we've had a Congress, um, most particularly since the Democrats uh, won the House in 2018. We've had the free press. We've had individual protesters, marchers, um, normal citizens who are involved in the political process. Um, we've had the courts, for example. And in various episodes, um, Norm being extremely involved in one of them, being the impeachment uh, hearing, um, the system has sort of flexed its muscles to try to push back on this president and try to reaffirm the values, the norms, the institutions that have defined America for 200 some odd years. And at times, I think it's been quite successful. And at times, I think even when the immediate objective was not achieved, um, for example, in the impeachment, that we achieved um, corollary goals, the reaffirmation of truth, the importance of the legislative branch, not as a dependency of the presidency, but as a co-equal branch. So even if battles have not necessarily been won at every juncture, and sometimes it seems like we're always losing the battle, in fact, um, this has not been the case. And I think the 2018 midterms was a very good example of that. And obviously we're gonna be confronted with another, which will be uh, the election in the middle of this pandemic. So we 
certainly have our work cut out for us for the rest of the year. But I think that you'll find um, in whether it's the pandemic, whether it's the election, whether it's a foreign policy crisis, um, whether it's really any issue you can think of, you're going to see the same traits from Trump, a denigration of reality, of truth, an attack on the free press, an attack on alternate sources of information, an attack on expertise, an attack on the independence of the courts, um, an attack on the legislative function. And the great challenge for America has been and will be for the remainder of his term, the degree to which we can contain him and maintain those institutions and norms. Jennifer Rubin, eloquent as always and very challenging as well. And before I go to Norman Eisen, uh, just let me remind people that you can call in and ask questions. There's a device on the Zoom uh, screen that allows you to do that, and we hope you will do it. Uh, and uh, I will be able to transfer your questions to uh, our panelists. Uh, Norman Eisen, uh, Mr. Ambassador, five minutes from you. Warren, thank you, Jen. It's an honor to be with you. Uh, Janice and David, thanks for having me back uh, to the lecture series. Uh, David and I have been working on lecture series together since 19, I think 1986. <laughs> we did a big, when I was uh, a, an uh, assistant director at the ADL and he was the director of the ADL, we did a big lecture series. I think Abba Eben came and spoke, I recall David. So I'm always, when David calls and asks me to participate in a lecture series or to do anything, I always say yes. Um, <laughs> I, I, there is um, a, uh, a direct line uh, between candidate Donald Trump telling Russia they'll be mightily rewarded if they hack Hillary Clinton's emails and them doing so hours later uh, that's in uh, 2016, uh, to the Donald Trump who responded uh, to the investigation uh, of, uh, uh, of Russia by threatening of the Russian attack on our elections, uh, by uh, threatening using reward, just as he used reward with Russia, the threat of punishment rising to the level as Bob Mueller found, of obstruction of justice. And the um, uh, uh, Donald Trump, of uh, the, 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 the master, as throughout his entire business career, the master of what I've just described, the quid pro quo, uh, Donald Trump saying, just as he said to Russia, can you do us, uh, you'll be mightily rewarded. And just as he said to his White House counsel, Don McGahn, um, uh, uh, can you do me a favor, get rid of Bob Mueller, to the Donald Trump who says to Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky, who says to the Ukrainian president, can you do us a favor though, setting off the Ukraine scandal and the uh, impeachment proceedings in which I was honored uh, to play a part. Uh, and uh, uh, so I, I heartily agree with Jen's assessment uh, that there, I think Adam Serwer wrote in the Atlantic, there, there are not many Trump scandals. There is one Trump scandal. It is the scandal of uh, the Trump quid pro quo. It is the scandal of uh, Trump putting himself, his personal and political interests first above uh, the public interest, the national interest, the common good. And we've seen that again with the COVID crisis, where his response, instead of thinking from day one, instead of thinking about what is in the best long-term interests of America, he minimized the crisis uh, for um, uh, 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 personal and political reasons uh, to avoid uh, casting any shade upon his reelection, I would argue and has continued to do all the things Jen talked about, the attack on truth, the attacks on the press, on expertise, um, and even, uh, uh, even on um, 
his own uh, functionaries in the executive branch disparaging them and threatening to abuse the courts where he's threatened to, um, uh, to litigate, his attorney general just threatened to litigate against any uh, mayors or governors who are not willing to, quote, do us a favor though, and run uh, their um, uh, uh, cities, uh, counties, or states as Trump would like, but are gonna try to do the right thing. So the, the Trump transactional attitude ties everything uh, together, uh, in my view, uh, over the past uh, three years. And I will say, finally, I think I've utilized my five minutes. I did squander uh, a full minute of it in paying various compliments. Uh, but I will say, to uh, round out my five minutes, that I think the American people are onto this. I was very shocked when initially you had, in, in, in poll after poll, you had more than half of Americans who thought Trump was doing a good job on the corona crisis. But as when we were preparing yesterday, uh, Jen and I were joking that uh, 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 those of us who are opposed to the president uh, do, do not have the power uh, to actually hold him to account. Only the president can do that. We can just help. And through his daily press conference, America has come to see the nakedly transactional and selfish nature of his uh, lifelong uh, uh, addiction to quid pro quos. And uh, I don't think they're going to uh, stand for it. And I'm pleased to see that the polling now reflects that. Well, Norman, uh, if I had been keeping careful track of your five minutes, I'd give you another minute at the end of the uh, program. But I haven't been doing that and, uh, and, and won't. Uh, let me go to back to uh, Jennifer and ask you this. Uh, you describe yourself and have been called by others as somebody who provides insights into the conservative movement. Uh, what do you, how do you explain what uh, Norm Eisen just said, that despite all that he has said, all the things that you have listed as well, uh, there still is so much support uh, for this president whom you very, almost described as un-American. Yeah. Um, I don't know that there's one global explanation, but I think there are a couple phenomena going on. One is those Republicans who have looked upon Trump transactionally, um, not coincidentally, that he was going to deliver certain things to them, a tax cut, judges that they preferred. And so they were then willing to overlook everything and anything. Those people were perhaps um, not unaware that Donald Trump um, lacked the mental, temperamental, ethical fitness that we expect of a president, but they were willing to go along because they thought there was something in it for them. There is another section, I think, of the Republican Party that has frankly um, become um, what we could only describe as a cult, a cult of authoritarianism, a cult of the personality. And whatever mouthing of conservative principles like limited government, objective truth, American leadership in the world that once bound conservatives together is gone. And now it is simply a party whose sole purpose is to keep Trump in power and to defend him at whatever cost. And that includes a right-wing media um, that is very much an auxiliary to this president. That includes various shadowy conservative groups of the type that have been organizing these so-called demonstrations in various uh, places. This comes from the large donor community, which is, um, I think, um, perhaps unlike the Democratic donor community, um, really the most ideological of Republicans. These are people who are true, true believers, um, and uh, they have bought into Trump hook, line, and well, sink. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but what do they believe? Um, they really believe in power. Um, and what they believe in is a negative assertion against people they perceive as their enemies. And that really, if you had to describe Trumpism, is what it's all about. It's resentment. It's the politics of white 
Christian resentment. These people have lost a position of numerical superiority, social and legal superiority in the country, and by gosh, they don't like it, and they feel that they are the victims. Um, if you look at the polling, you will see white evangelicals believe that um, the majority, great majority do, that white evangelicals are the most discriminated people against uh, in America, not African Americans, not people with disabilities, not gays, um, but they are the victims. And Trump has played them like a fiddle, channeling his own resentment towards elites, towards the Manhattan crowd that never really accepted him. And it, um, whether or not they achieve their ends, at least they think they are tormenting the bad guys. And the bad guys are all of us. Um, the intellectuals, um, the media, the uh, larger uh, academia, um, experts, science, um, whatever they can throw up against the wall to push back against those, they consider a victory for them. It is really the ultimate power uh, and the ultimate politics of resentment. And if you had to identify one thing that holds them together, it's not an ideological position. Hello? Did we lose you? Oh, you're Hello? Still We're here. We can still hear you. All right. Uh, I seem to have lost my picture, but if you can see me, that's great. Um, but it's really this politics of resentment that is the main uh, glue that holds them all together. Warren, well, I would just, I, I would just add to that, having had the uh, opportunity to live on the floor of the Senate for several weeks uh, and talk to the senators, both Democratic and Republican, and both on and off the record, uh, I would add three points to Jen's uh, incisive analysis. Um, the first is that um, the, uh, she accurately describes, I agree with her description of, the, uh, of Trump's electoral base. It also describes, it was so amazing both on the floor uh, of the House and on the floor of the Senate to see the representatives that they have chosen and the, um, uh, the way they mirror that base. But those uh, uh, representatives, um, bring a, and Jen referred to this, they bring a wide array of special interests to the table. So um, I'm sure Mitch McConnell uh, thinks of Trump as a useful idiot, but he's able, there are certain things, there aren't many, there are certain things Mitch McConnell cares about. He deeply cares about federal judges and whatever else Trump may say or do, he's gotten a lot of the federal judges through that Mitch McConnell wants. And I do think that it has ominous historical echoes um, uh, for those of us who are students of history and who look at the dictators of the 20th century and their origins and the various special interests who said, well, he'll take care of the communists for me or he'll restore the business sector for me. Uh, oh, I don't take him seriously. I don't believe, to the, I don't believe the words he speaks. Um, and the third point I wanted to make is, so there's the point about the political leadership, there's the point about history. The third point I wanted to make is that there are other elements to the coalition and one of the most interesting, uh, for example, uh, there's a fragmentation in the Jewish community and while the vast ma majority of Jewish voters, probably close to 80%, um, are anti-Trump and will support uh, anyone but Trump, um, there is a substantial subset, and Trump has been very expert in micro-targeting groups that he needs. There's a substantial subset who are attracted by his perceived defense of the state of Israel. Having followed his career, uh, I, I believe he would, if, he, if it suited him politically, he would throw Israel under the bus in an instant. Uh, but he's persuaded a subset of the Jewish community that he's a strong Israel supporter. So that's an example of the other smaller members of the coalition that account for his, um, uh, for his uh, presence in the White House. Let me ask you about this question. Uh, to what extent is Trump not really responsible uh, for the uh, base that he now has? Uh, and to what extent, because 
he wasn't part of the uh, government. He had nothing to do with it whatsoever. He wasn't, uh, he didn't set anything up uh, in advance. Uh, obviously, he wasn't in that position. He was able to take, take advantage of what he found the situation to be. But what about that situation? And to what extent is the so-called establishment, which would include the Democrats as well as the Republicans, it seems to me, uh, responsible for the fact that we now have this vast disparity of wealth and income in this country, that there's so many things that people are resentful about and have a good reason to be resentful about. And uh, are the Democrats in particular uh, doing what they need to do uh, to try to address those questions in such a way that Trump wouldn't be able to take advantage of them anymore? Well, since Jen has been so uh, bracing for all these years in uh, taking on some of her own former allies, and I think future allies, because I am of the school that the, you know, the fever will pass and there'll be some who come back to reason. It has to, we can't survive in this. Uh, it's uh, when, when I saw my former friends, uh, uh, the things they were saying in the House and the Senate, people I know to be reasonable, the shocking things that they said, I had to ask myself, how can the country survive? But since Jen is so good uh, ab about um, being a candid, uh, I'll, I'll go first, Warren, and, and say that the Democratic Party has had many, many failures um, in, um, uh, in uh, um, uh, the creating the situation, the imbalance uh, that uh, of of wealth and power and influence. Um, there's no shortage of Democratic lobbyists uh, in Washington D.C. Uh, when I was in the Obama administration, my job was to try to screen them off to the extent possible from influencing our policy, but it was impossible. We banned. Uh, we put all the meetings uh, in the White House, we put online. One of the first things Trump did when he came in was to eliminate that program. But we had over by the end of the Obama administration, six million of those meetings. So the lobbyists just went and met with their friends at the nearby coffee shop. We referred to it as the Caribou coffee exemption. I would actually leave my <laughs> office and go walk over to Caribou coffee to see who was meeting with Democratic lobbyists. So, you know, there's a, if you look through administrations of both parties, <clears throat> what you'll see is the inexorable pressure of the wealthy and powerful. Now, I don't want to create, a, 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 that in turn uh, gets them more and more loopholes, more favorable legislation, more money, which they can then, particularly post Citizens United, pump back into the system to get still more power. And I don't want to create a false asymmetry. I think the Democrats have been better about trying to address this, uh, but certainly there's plenty of blame uh, to go around and we have to be more serious about it. And I, for one, even though I don't agree with everybody uh, in the um, uh, uh, more uh, left, uh, reaches of my party. I think it's great that they're a part of the big tent because they are forcing the conversation in a way that is very healthy on these issues of the asymmetries of wealth and power. Well, I look at it in a couple of ways. There is a part of the Trump phenomenon that is uniquely American, and that goes to the original sin of America, which is race. Um, it has always been present in times of economic and social change. It becomes more intensified. And to a large degree, the Trump phenomenon is a story of white racism and white xenophobia. When you really took a deep dive into the 2016 results, it was not the people who had been economically dislocated that were in the Trump camp. It was not people of modest or low income. It was people who were pretty well off. Off. Um, but what they shared was a cultural racial resentment, which I spoke about earlier. So in that sense, that part is unique to Trump insofar as that he was able to play that like a fiddle, work that up, work those people into a frenzy. 
But there's also something else going on, and it's not unique to America. And although we like to think of ourselves as completely sui generis, in fact, all over the world, we see the same phenomenon of right-wing populism. We see a large percentage of the population losing faith in democracy as a form of government. We see that globalization um, has led to economic dislocation and to great uh, accumulation of wealth until the haves and the have-nots are quite separate, some of that caused by policy, some of that caused um, by a new economic order. And democracies and democratic institutions have not responded to that sense of um, what's in it for me. If a democracy cannot deliver on the promise of well-distributed prosperity, um, there are going to be problems. And there are going to be people who begin to, as we saw in the 1930s in Europe, who say the problem is all those politicians. What we need is a strong man. What we need is someone to get things done. All of this talk, all of this debate is leading to dysfunction. Um, and there becomes an animosity towards democracy government itself. And that is to a large degree what Trump has also incorporated. We're not alone. We've seen that same pattern. It's reared its ugly head in Poland, in Hungary. Um, there was a close, a relatively close election early in Trump's uh, term um, in France, although Macron won. Uh, the right-wing party really doubled its uh, support. And of course, from Putin um, and uh, the noxious force of the Russians in the world. So I think we've had this um, really convergence of these two um, really malignant forces. One is um, the unique um, racial issues that have paralyzed and perplexed America for 200 some odd years. And the other is this real failure of democracies to grapple with um, a new economy, industrial, uh, really post-industrial um, economies and globalism. And I think uh, in the juncture of those two things, you get Donald Trump. David Lehrer, let me ask you, I think that you are sending me questions, but not leading them up long enough for me to write them down. Uh, am I right or do we have not have any questions? I keep seeing these things flash up and it says somebody has something, but then it goes away. Uh, we're not familiar with this. We haven't done it before. And uh, so uh, forgive me for not understanding it too well. We do have questions, I understand. Um, let's see one. Um, if, you can, if you can get it up there. Let's, uh, let's see. Um, okay, this is a question from somebody, but it does not unfortunately have a complete sentence or uh, oh, I see. It says I should scroll down on my q and A. I don't have a q and A, uh, and I don't think I have been set up for that. Can you repeat it in my ear? Can you uh, show it to me at length? Because I really want to give our our audience an opportunity to chime in. Uh, it's that kind of audience. Okay, here somebody wants to know uh, who is the ideal pick for vice president for. Uh, uh, for uh, for former Vice President uh, uh, Joe Biden, that's not a bad idea, not a, not a bad thing to talk about. So uh, we're going to be talking about what's going, where are we headed? Uh, I was going to ask another question, which is, uh, what do we do if Trump gets reelected? But I can ask that later. Uh, what about the, uh, Jennifer, you look eager to answer that one. Uh, what about a Vice Presidential nominee uh, for Joe Biden? Well, he has already limited his choices by saying he wants to pick a woman candidate. And, limited, to, uh, limited the choice to half the population. Exactly. Um, maybe a great half of the population, but it's half. <laughs> So I think he has to decide, frankly, um, not whether the person is African-American and white, old or young in the Senate or in a governorship, but what he wants that person to be. Does he want it to be someone who's going to help him get elected, who's going to really energize the base and get people out to vote? Or is he looking for someone who's going to help him govern? And because he is um, going to be one of our older presidents, um, who could plausibly step into the presidency on a moment's notice. 
Now, from what he has said publicly, I tend to think it's the latter, that he says he wants to find someone who's ideologically simpatico. He wants to find someone who is uh, prepared to step into the presidency. And I think that tendency obviously has been greatly um, encouraged by the pandemic. Um, the American people obviously are um, very desirous, and I think Biden's big push and big appeal is for functional, rational, mature, competent government. So were he to pick someone who had never served in federal office, for example, or never had any kind of executive function, I think that would severely undercut what he is presenting. So I think the philosophy in the Biden camp, as it is in many presidential camps, is the vice president cannot win you an election, but the vice president can lose you an election. And so within all those confines, my thought is that he is probably looking for someone who has been well vetted in the public eye, perhaps during the uh, presidential campaign, someone who is seen as intelligent, as able to grapple with policy issues, um, someone who has um, an ideology that is center left um, as his is, um, and who um, has broad support within the Democratic Party. And I think um, among the former competitors who would kind of fit that bill, I think you certainly have to look at Amy Klobuchar and you have to look at uh, Senator uh, Kamala Harris. Um, if he wants to go the gubernatorial route, um, there is, of course, that woman from Michigan, who I think has done herself a great deal of good lately, Gretchen Whitmer of uh, Michigan. But there are also other governors or former governors. Maggie Hassan uh, may be a little bit of an underdog. She is now a senator from New Hampshire. She was the governor of New Hampshire. So if you're looking for someone who is perceived as someone competent, who can manage a crisis, who can manage a large bureaucracy, someone of that ilk uh, may be the choice. Um, but I don't have any inside information on this. And what we do know is that he's naming a committee to pick the vice president or help him pick the vice president. And that committee will be named by uh, May 1. OK, I was just told that. Uh, excuse me for interrupting. I was just told that I may be able to get some questions via text. And David, if that's the case, remember, you had my phone number wrong yesterday. So uh, get it from Jeff and text me on that number, not some other number. Uh, Norm, go ahead. You wanted to cut, chime in. Just very quickly, um, knowing the vice president, uh, he is a man of the Senate. He loves the Senate. He believes in the Senate. Uh, his presidency, should he win, will rise or fall on his relations with the Senate, whether it's a Republican or a Democratic one. So I think there is going to be a strong impulse uh, to uh, pick one of the senators who was in the pool uh, of candidates. Um, it's very hard to know. Uh, which of the uh, three each brings strengths and weaknesses, all of them would be uh, superb. Uh, your uh, California senator is certainly uh, not the least of the three. But is that a good idea in terms of the anti-establishment uh, attitude that so many voters have and that so many Trump voters have? You're gonna have to have a few of them, it would seem to me, uh, you can't win without any of them. Uh, so is, it, is there a risk there of uh, making it sound too much like uh, the same old, same old? Well, I think there is a faction of the Trump coalition that is gettable and there is a faction that is not. The people who hate immigrants, the people who think global warming is all a hoax, are not gettable for a candidate like Joe Biden. So you can kind of forget about those people. The people that he does have a chance to attract are the people who may have voted for Barack Obama in 2008 and 2012. Um, these are the sort of Main Street Republicans who thought, oh, he can't be that bad. He's really a businessman. He'll be a moderate. So there is a faction, I think, of people who voted for Trump 
who are now amenable to voting for a Democrat, perhaps a moderate Democrat, which I think um, in many ways Joe Biden is. And I think at this point, his appeal is not to um, be an outsider, but to be someone who, as he says, restores the soul of the nation, who de-trumps the government, who puts us back on a footing of sanity, who gets us through a pandemic, who can get the economy turned around again, and perhaps can pick up with uh, some of the initiatives that were, frankly, thrown over the overboard um, by Donald Trump, for example, the Paris Accords, and to work um, strenuously on climate change. So I don't think he's going to run, and I don't think he's going to win as someone who is a rabble rouser. Um, that's not kind of who he is. That said, I think there are people who don't represent um, business as usual. And I come back to Kamala Harris. She hasn't been in Washington, D.C. all that long. Um, she was elected um, the same year that Donald Trump was elected in the Senate, um, spent most of her career as a lawyer, prosecutor in California. Um, and she was one, for example, who um, sued the big banks and the lenders during the financial meltdown. So I think people who have taken on large conglomerations of power, be it the drug companies, be it um, the financial institutions, are people who might have some appeal to those individuals who think that the system really does need to be shaken okay. up, that there need to be um, some real changes. All right, very good. And it seems to me that uh, the choice of vice president is uh, probably more important uh, this time around than it normally is. Generally speaking, we say the vice president doesn't matter. Uh, but uh, given Joe Biden's age and uh, uh, what that might mean. Uh, obviously, it's a very important thing. We do have, a, we've got a, a, a listener question. I got it on my text, David. Thank you for that. And it is this, the consensus, excuse me, uh, do you think that uh, President Trump might try to use the corona crisis, coronavirus crisis, uh, to postpone the election? Norm, what do you think? Well, I think that uh, uh, Trump is, uh, capable of trying uh, anything that he can get away with, but that he can't get away with that. There is no legal provision. There's no constitutional provision for it. Um, I believe that if there were an attempt to do it, uh, you would soon have a court order from the Supreme Court. I don't think he would defy uh, court order. It, it, so the answer is, I'm not anticipating that. Um, I, uh, I will say that this, it, it does raise the question, the larger question for me of how far will Trump go? You know, is he a, is he a Berlusconi, a Mussolini, uh, or, or something worse? Um, not everybody with illiberal tendencies who seizes power uh, immediately turns into uh, the the worst nightmare. They tend to do it. Jen was talking about Orban. You can look at um, uh, Erdogan in Turkey. Uh, you can look at the trajectory of the current Polish um, ruling government. Um, you know, they go step by step. And I, whatever Trump's, sure, he has that quote unquote joke, uh, he likes to uh, say Trump, uh, Trump for president 2020, 2024, 2028, 2032. Uh, but I think he knows, if you look at his career, Warren, he knows this is Trump's peculiar genius, actually. Um, he knows exactly how far he can go uh, without, um, uh, um, getting, um, uh, uh, going over the edge. Uh, you know, he lives on the edge of the law, but he so, so far has but, but, been but very because successful of that, because in lives, not toppling over that edge. Because he lives on the edge of the law, uh, he has more at stake, it seems to me, than any other president might uh, in losing an election, because it's very possible that he might be prosecuted. Uh, for some of the things that were mentioned when you were doing the uh, uh, the uh, uh, trial, uh, but of course all the things that came out in the Mueller report and many other things as well that have cropped up, uh, particularly uh, coming from the uh, Southern District of New York and the uh, U.S. Attorney there. 
I don't think he's going to be prosecuted. You just it, don't think they'll do it. It'll be like President Ford uh, pardoning. I don't think uh, he's going to need. I don't think he's going to need a formal pardon. You know, there are technical. Perhaps he should have been prosecuted for some of those issues. There are going to be statute of limitations considerations around many of them. There'll be a political consideration ultimately. We do not have a tradition in our country, the opposite of uh, prosecuting people, even when, like Trump, they've, I mean, we are, wrote in our Judiciary Committee impeachment report that we issued at the, um, after uh, voting articles out of the committee, we wrote an extensive ex explanation of why Trump at least should have been criminally charged, would have been criminally charged if he were anybody else for his conduct. Uh, in uh, Ukraine, but I, I really, uh, I don't see that. I think the country will, if as I expect, uh, the country turns him out, um, I think that they will heave a sigh of relief and not want to have an endless, uh, from the Oval Office on down, not want to have an endless uh, rerun of the Trump years by criminally prosecuting him. Okay, That's so Jennifer, uh, here's, here's a questioner who asked this. Uh, are we so divided now? We hear so much about tribalism in this country, and we see people uh, walking around with a lot of guns, and we know that uh, there are more guns in this country than there are uh, human beings. Uh, one questioner wants to know, are we so divided that we might have some sort of civil war? Or let me just uh, uh, modify that one a bit and say, uh, are we in, at risk of having violent uprisings uh, if, in fact, uh, President Trump is not reelected? Um, let me say two things about uh, the election and that being the second. The first is the Republicans have decided that they cannot win elections if the electorate really reflects American society. America is becoming more diverse. It's becoming um, less um, of a white electorate. Um, more non-whites uh, are voting. Um, a very large generation of millennials is moving up. They've decided that the way they're going to hold on to power is not by appealing to those people, but by really suppressing the vote. And that has been their tactic um, ever since um, a now infamous court decision, Shelby, um, which uh, essentially eviscerated um, what they call the preclearance of the Voting Rights Act that allowed states to essentially make all kinds of changes. And what they proceeded to do was to uh, enact policies, voter ID, closing polling places, uh, limiting the amount of early voting um, that discouraged essentially poor people and non-whites from voting. And that's how they um, continued to dominate uh, or at least be competitive. We've already seen that again, and we saw this in Wisconsin, where the Republican Party went to court to force people to either give up the right to vote or to go out in the middle of a pandemic and risk becoming ill or even dying in order to cast the vote. So I think that is something that we clearly have to keep an eye on, that there will be attempts to suppress and to limit the vote like nobody's business um, this time around. Let's flip to the other side um, in terms of what may happen after the election. First important thing is, if it's not close, they can't cheat. Um, so we should hope for a very decisive election, um, which is not a razor thin margin, um, frankly, as we had in 2016, where it was three states, uh, less than 80,000 votes. If the results are overwhelming, I think that greatly diminishes the opportunity for mischief making. Sure. There is a very real concern, I think, that, quote, Trump won't leave, or worse, that he will not recognize the legitimacy of the election. And that's the game he and others have played over and over again, that there's been voting fraud, that the results are somehow unreliable, that if it goes the wrong way, it must be because the other side cheated. And I don't put it past Trump or some of his supporters to attempt to litigate election results in various states. I think, however, we shouldn't get too carried away with that. I think the states have uh, secretaries of state who are, um, frankly, both Democrat and Republican who are sort of onto this and who are looking to defend the vote. 
We've seen um, really new efforts to try to expand voting by mail, um, no excuse absentee voting, which is very important in order to get a robust turnout. Um, so I think we should be alert both to the shenanigans going up to the election and the shenanigans um, coming out of it. Um, but I do tend to agree with Norm that we have some very strong institutional popular checks in place. And uh, we should remember that the majority of states now, including those swing states like Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, have Democratic governors, um, in some cases, Democratic secretaries of state. Um, so I think there is a bit of a, self, uh, a fail safe in place um, in many of these key states. Okay, but Norman, before I go back to you, or, or perhaps I can put this question to you, uh, we have one from uh, Joel Bellman, who is somebody I think a lot of people in this audience uh, probably know, and perhaps our panelists know him as well. He says this, so many of us have been asking ourselves, why don't Democrats articulate or demonstrate more resistance uh, to more of Trump's outrageous attacks on our governors, on federalism, on his own CDC people, et cetera? Obviously, there won't be a second imp impeachment. But is there something else Democrats can and should be doing to push back on Trump's increasingly radical right declarations? Uh, Norm Eisen, that one goes to you. Uh, well, Joel, <clears throat> I think that was part of the thesis of the impeachment. I know that and uh, it was uh, stated openly on the floor of the House. Uh, Mr. Nadler, Mr. Schiff, the speaker, they all said, look, um, Trump gave us no choice. <clears throat> the conduct is bad enough. We have this power. We're using it. You know, the other, the other part of that sentence is he gave us no choice, even though we are unlikely to persuade 67 United States senators. We have to do everything in our power. This is a tool that's in our power. I, I guess that I uh, believe that uh, as a whole, uh, the modes of resistance both within and outside of the government have performed not perfectly, you're right, there could be more that, that could be done. But having sat there in the House and seen how hard it was to get uh, an impeachment going, I, I think the, the, the modes of resistance uh, have per performed, and Jen listed them when we started, um, the free press, expertise within, Trump, within Trump's own government, the courts, uh, lawyers and the legal function, they've performed pretty well. You know, Trump is in a constant state, even within his own government. There's a whistleblower today about COVID. He's in a constant state of war with the IGs and the whistleblowers and the experts, his but again, own former that's exactly what Joel. That's exactly what Joel is talking about. And uh, why aren't the Democrats doing more? Are they, in fact, also afraid of not necessarily the Trump base, but the people who might be persuadable one way or the other, uh, uh, thinking that uh, uh, they're simply not doing what needs to be done, staying home on election day? Well. I I think the Democrats, if you look at the bill, and then I'll, I'll pass it over to Jen, if you look at the, um, the latest COVID bill that is now moving, uh, Mitch McConnell said, well, you're getting $250 billion, take it or leave it. If you don't take it, we're going to demonize you. The uh, Democrats in the Senate, who remember blinked on the government shutdown two years ago, they were absolutely implacable on getting money for for testing, for hospitals, uh, additional priorities. So I could give many, many other examples. I think the system is resisting and um, both inside and outside of Trump's own government. Yeah, I think um, I agree with Norm. I think um, the internal resistance, the Democrats could have no better warrior that country could have no better Speaker of the House than Nancy Pelosi, who has gone toe-to-toe -to -toe with Trump, who on a regular basis um, confronts him on his lies, on a regular basis, comes back to um, truth-telling, comes back to um, the needs of the country. And so internally, I think she's done quite a bit to push back. But ultimately, what's the check? What is the way of resisting? It's elections. And that's what Democrats did in 2018. 
there has been a surge, I think, of participatory democracy, people self-organizing into groups, into protest marches, into efforts, into registration. We saw a massive turnout in 2018. We saw the House um, turn over. Um, we are seeing now a massive amount of money being spent for Democrats in the Senate race. We haven't talked too much about the Senate um, in this uh, conversation, but the Senate now, I think, is very much in play. Huge gains. Um, in terms of um, finance, in terms of money raising for Democrats um, in some uh, states that you wouldn't think normally would be in play. And then ultimately, it's about voting and turnout. That is the major function um, of democracy, and that is to hold elected officials accountable and throw the bums out if they haven't done a good job. And I think that's um, a major force um, that can be used. I actually do think that the COVID crisis in a very bizarre way has really made life very, very difficult for Trump. You can lie about a lot of things. You can spin a lot of things. You can finger point um, to many, many people. But ultimately and tragically, over 45,000 Americans have died. Over 80,000 are infected. And ultimately, the American people now are afraid for their health, for their safety, for their economy. And you know what? The buck really does stop um, at the president. And no American president has been reelected in the middle of a recession. And boy, do we have a recession right now. OK, we began by giving you each five minutes or so, something like that. As I said, I didn't keep track. Uh, but we're coming to the end of the program. And let me give you each one minute to ask the question. Uh, what has gone on and where are we headed? Norm Eisen, you first. Well, for me, the, the, the most important unanswered question uh, is uh, what comes after Election Day? And the two possibilities are uh, ultimately, uh, there, if it's close, as Jen says, uh, that's where the trouble will lie. If it's a second Trump term, that's really when the massive resistance that many of you are calling for. I'm reading the chat and the Q&A. Um, that energy will be needed. And for me, I'd like to leave you on the question, because I don't think it's going to be a second Trump term, uh, the question of how we heal this uncivil uh, war of words and ideas uh, that we've uh, lived in for the past uh, three years plus. How do we heal that? That is going to be the number one challenge uh, should Trump be out. Jennifer. Yeah. Um, first of all, thank you again for inviting me and for pairing me up against uh, Norm um, and, uh, and you, Warren. So thank I'm, you. I'm not sure against is the right term. But <laughs> no, with pairing us up together. Put it thank there. you. There, there you go. All right. Um, I think there are two great tasks, um, and I do think um, we will have a new president. One is to see if post-pandemic, and eventually there will be a post-pandemic, we can come to something better. We can come to an economy that works better for people at the lower end. If we can learn something about distance learning, if we can learn something about healthcare, if we can learn something about building out our public healthcare system. Um, Andrew Cuomo, the governor of New York, talks about this very frequently now. Can we come, can we learn from this, and we, can we come to something better on many of those fundamental issues we've been wrestling with for a very long time? And the second question is, what have we learned about the presidency and about our constitution that needs to be shored up? What sorts of things do we need to do to make elections fair, to make um, the president's powers align better with the constitutional intent? And there are a ream of reforms, everything from limiting contacts um, between political figures in the Oval Office and the Justice Department to automatic uh, voter registration and voting by mail for everyone in the United States, a whole raft of things in various areas. And and I think the mantra for the Biden administration should be, after they um, hopefully 
pull us through um, this terrible pandemic and the recession is reform, 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 to rebuild and strengthen those democratic institutions that we talked about at the beginning that really had faltered and to see if we can restore some trust, some faith, some competency back to our federal government. And if we can do that, we will have come through Donald Trump um, perhaps stronger than we went in. Okay, at the crossroads, we'll have another session. And next Wednesday with uh, Brett Stevens of the New York Times and uh, Nick Goldberg, a former editor of the editorial pages of the Los Angeles Times. And as was indicated earlier on May 13th, it's going to be a whole hour of Adam Schiff. I think a lot of people are going to want to watch that. Jennifer Rubin and Norm Eisen, it's been a privilege to be with you guys. Uh, David and uh, Janice, thank you so much for inviting me uh, to participate as well. And thanks to all of you for listening and watching.